This is Duke University. Good morning. Uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of the school uh, to the session on hedge fund activism. Uh, my name is Alon Brav. I uh, first of all also want to thank our alumni for taking the time uh, to join us and participate. I, um, uh, I would like to first of all introduce myself and then uh, go through uh, the structure of uh, what I'd like to present. Um, as I said, you know, I've been, my name is Alon Brav. I've taught in the finance department uh, since fall of 1997, so I've been here for quite a long time. Um, most of the research that I've done over the past decade has focused on hedge fund activism. Uh, practically all of my academic research over the last eight years or so has focused entirely uh, on this area. Uh, and beforehand, before that, I uh, focus mainly on um, uh, market anomalies, market efficiency, irrationality in markets, arbitrage, limits to arbitrage, and that sort of was the first part of my career, and then I transitioned more into uh, what we're going to focus on today. Um, uh, what I know that will happen today is that uh, we'll receive questions. I understand you will send, be sending them either via email or uh, by tweeting them. I have a few of them already with me uh, and what I'll try to do is weave uh, these questions uh, in those particular parts of the uh, presentation as we'll go along. Um, and so uh, uh, let me uh, begin by telling you a little bit about how uh, we're going to structure this presentation. I'll give you about a two-minute overview of uh, how to think about hedge fund activism as a new phenomenon, a new uh, mechanism, governance mechanism. And uh, after sort of uh, 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 giving you that overview and motivation, we will then look at uh, various descriptive statistics about activism, mainly in the U.S., and uh, focus on uh, potentially any value added uh, by these activities the impact on the firms that are targeted by hedge fund activists. And I'll conclude with uh, uh, a range of topics that we're currently studying, uh, given this is a new phenomenon, what are people looking at uh, when we're studying hedge fund activism. And so uh, let me first begin with sort of the motivation. Uh, the idea that institutions in general might be able to engage with uh, corporations and by engaging with the board, by engaging with the management, alleviate some of the agency problems, uh, uh, the conflict between management and shareholders is not new. And uh, there's been a lot of academic research in the 80s and 90s uh, that has looked at such engagements, mainly by pension funds, mutual funds, and the big hope at the time was that these institutions would be able, by engaging with corporations, and to bring about, to, to uh, uh, improve the governance and therefore the operations of these targeted companies. But uh, research mainly in the, uh, about 10 years ago uh, that sort of tried to summarize what we've learned has found that uh, uh, there's really no impact. When you look at the engagements that pension funds and mutual funds have had uh, with these corporations, uh, whether you look at stock prices, when you look at profitability, there was just no strong evidence that engagement by those institutions uh, led to significant changes. And this is sort of the background for where you, we have uh, uh, hedge funds uh, and hedge fund activism as institutions that engage with management. Uh, this is a phenomena that I would date back to the late 90s uh, uh, that uh, has become more prominent. This is the focus of our, um, uh, this, this presentation today. And you may ask then, why is it that hedge funds would be any different than these earlier institutions? Uh, and to that, uh, we can point to several uh, features of the organizational structure of hedge funds that 
could potentially lead to differences in the outcomes when they engage with corporations. And so when you look at the incentive structure, the 2 and 20 compensation that the hedge fund manager receives is uh, significantly higher and stronger than what a pension fund manager or a mutual fund manager um, receives. The ability uh, uh, to um, lever up, use derivatives, go completely undiversified, invest as much as you want from your fund into a particular targeted company is something, again, that those earlier institutions just could not do. Uh, there are no conflicts of interest. So earlier institutions, pension funds at times, might have had conflicts of interest since they wanted some other business with the targeted companies. This is not the case with uh, hedge funds, hedge fund activists. And so when you add all these features, along with obviously the uh, amount of capital that has steadily uh, been allocated to these hedge funds, you might think that the outcome of these engagements will be different. Of course, whether it's different good or different bad is something that I want to focus on and present evidence and uh, have you share with and see and uh, obviously conclude for yourself whether it's for the best or not. And so um, this literature is obviously evolving and uh, I'll point mainly to my own research as I'm biased, but uh, at times I also refer to research by other uh, people that have looked at various aspects of the uh, activism phenomena. All right, so most of the data that we will focus on today is uh, US-centric, and so where do we get the data? How could you learn about engagements, interventions that are currently occurring? The source of the data, the source of our data, is uh, Schedule 13D filings that activists make with the SEC when they've reached a certain threshold of ownership in the targeted company. So in particular, uh, in cases where the activists uh, own more than 5% of the equity of the targeted company, they have 10 days from the day in which they've crossed that 5% threshold to file with the SEC and uh, tell the world effectively, here we are, uh, uh, these are the funds that have in total purchased more than 5%, uh, here are my intentions uh, with uh, uh, what I want to do with vis-a-vis -vis the company. And uh, uh, this is a filing that is publicly available. And in fact, uh, if we can point to, I think, this uh, um, slide uh, uh, seven that hopefully is projected on your screen, you will see I've just uh, picked one at random. Uh, well, not exactly at random, but one that, that, that I like. This is Pershing Square engagement with uh, Fortune Brands. And so if you Google that after this presentation, you just Google Fortune Brands Pershing Square 13D, you will get the link to, to this filing. You can obviously go to the SEC website and search for that filing as well. And that filing uh, will, again, as I said, present uh, the first piece of evidence that there is an engagement uh, I tell you who's the activist, the targeted company, the stake that they've purchased. In fact, those filings also tell you how the activists traded in the 60 days leading up to the filing, how they amassed part of their equity stake. Those filings are the source for the data that we've collected. So we've collected, uh, we've went back to the mid-90s all the way to 2011 and collected all such filings made by activist investors in the U.S. There are some additional constraints. We don't, for example, follow closed and funds, uh, other restrictions, but by and large, these are all the 13Ds filed over that period uh, with the SEC. Uh, there, are other file there are other instances in which activists just don't have enough capital uh, uh, and because the target is just too big, so they may just own, say, 2% or 1.5% in the target. We try to collect those as well, and those will feature also in the data, in the results that I'll show you uh, in a bit later. So that's the source of the data uh, that, that, that we're basing our, most of our studies on. And if we can put up the slide 8 uh, on the screen, uh, what you can see uh, is the um, trend in uh, the number of events 
and the uh, uh, number of uh, hedge funds uh, since the mid 90s through 2011. And so you can see sort of two main features. First of all, the trend in activism, the fact that it has steadily been increasing over uh, the sample period that we have. And I'm pretty confident that if you increase the, the extended the, the period through 2014, you will observe an increasing trend. So you can see that in 2011, we have roughly 150 engagements. I think that in 2014, as I recently read, there were 150 engagements by mid-year. And so uh, uh, this is an increasing trend. Uh, uh, and one other feature which is interesting is the pro-cyclicality of activism. You can see sort of these uh, uh, boom and sort of bust uh, that tend to mirror the economy as a whole. For example, the most recent uh, peak in activism was 2007, 2006. And uh, 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 this is, uh, I would say, it would be true if you extended the sample through 2014, you'd see the activism peak. Um, the bottom plot, you can see the number of uh, um, hedge funds that uh, uh, have been engaged in activism. And again, as a popular strategy, you see more entry uh, uh, of uh, new funds as strategies become uh, more popular. Uh, we'll come back to the pro-cyclicality, which is very interesting because you might think that as more funds come in with a reasonably fixed supply of targets, competition would uh, come in. And so that says something about the profitability of activism. And so I'll touch upon that uh, uh, a bit in a bit, a bit later. So that's the general trends in, 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 in activism in the U.S. Uh, clearly not uh, going away, but uh, strong and getting stronger through uh, the latter part in the sample. Um, what do we do with these filings? So we, we obtain all these filings, we read through them, we read through all subsequent amendments to these filings to trace out how the uh, engagement evolves. Uh, whether the activist, for example, increases uh, the stake in the target company. Typically, when you change your stake by more than 1%, you have to file an amendment. And so we track all of these amendments. In fact, we track them all the way to the point where the activist, again, falls below 5%, which is a rough proxy for the uh, termination of the engagement. So all of that is collected, all that information is collected, and what we think that we can do is say, well, what is it that they want? And in roughly, I would say, 60% of these engagements, uh, the activist, at least early on, is, uh, uh, chooses to remain uh, somewhat um, mum on what they want to do. So you'll typically see uh, general statements about undervaluation of the target, uh, the willingness to engage with management, but there's no specific uh, uh, goal that is delineated in the 13D filing. So in the Fortune uh, Brands case, uh, in fact, if you read through that 13D schedule, there's no specific uh, goal that is stated in the filing, although if you, again, search the media, uh, around the time, uh, sort of in the subsequent month or two, you will see clearly that the media was already focused on the fact that Pershing Square uh, would push Fortune Brand, which was sort of a diversified conglomerate, to spin off some of its non-core divisions. Uh, and this is in indeed what happened eventually uh, with uh, this um, target company. Pershing Square, by the way, has been in the news, uh, is constantly in the news. Uh, one question that came up by David Arthur was Pershing Square engagement, uh, where they teamed up recently with Valent Pharmaceutical uh, in Valent's attempt to take over uh, Allergan. Uh, and this is sort of certainly a new pairing of an activist fund with a company, with an acquirer. And, uh, you can think of the benefits of doing that in the sense that 
uh, Pershing Square was able to amass close to a 10% stake in uh, Adergan. Pershing Square perhaps would be better, uh, would be a good uh, way to communicate and amass and convince other institutional holders that Valiant's strategy is the right strategy. So you can see sort of why that pairing uh, um, uh, happened. Uh, of course, this case is still ongoing. So Pershing Square, uh, uh, Fortune Brands, JCPenney, Target uh, has been uh, constantly uh, uh, engaged with larger and larger cap targets. But again, Fortune Brands is a case where we don't see a specific goal stated earlier on. Nevertheless, in the remaining cases, we see several other categories. So there will be capital structure related demands where the activists will early on say, I want you to stop that season equity offering. I want you to increase the payout. I want you perhaps to change your leverage. All of these are classified, we classify as capital structure changes. You may see business strategy uh, demands, uh, marketing, cost cutting as another category uh, where the activist has a specific goal and a specific white paper that delineates what they think needs to be done. Another category, perhaps the one that elicits the strongest price reaction upon announcement is capital reallocation. And so in the Fortune Brands case, the idea that I want you to sell a non-core division, or I want you, in the case of Darden, uh, recently there was uh, a request by the activists to sell you know, their, an olive garden or to sell uh, uh, the Red Lobster. These are cases where the activist believes that focusing the target on its core or the main brand uh, might lead to uh, higher efficiency. And those are the ones that are associated typically with the strongest price reaction. Finally, there's a category that has to do with governance-related demands by the activists, and those may range from dissatisfaction with the CEO, the compensation structure, poison pill removal, uh, destaggering the board. All of these we categorize as governance-related demands. Uh, and of course, you may see, uh, as I said, you know, more than one of these categories uh, uh, stated and demanded uh, early on by the activist. And so uh, what, I don't know if the next slide can be seen, if you can put up slide 10, there's a little bit of, uh, uh, the font is too small perhaps, but let me tell you a little bit of what that, what we're trying to do in that slide, that information. So with these filings, once we have determined what are the objectives, uh, we want to know what is the typical stake that an activist uh, will amass in the target firm, right? You may think that, 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 that uh, these activists are going for, you know, 20, 30, 50 percent stake in the target, but this is not the case. The median stake, so if you take our roughly 25, 2600 events, and you ask what is the median stake in the, in the typical, what's the typical stake in a target firm, it's on the order of 6 percent. 6%. You have to really go to the extreme of the distribution to look at ownership stakes of 15 up to 20%. So the key difference of hedge fund activism versus earlier forms of, 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 of uh, the market for corporate control is that the activist is going to seek the uh, uh, um, help and understanding of other uh, shareholders in order to uh, convince management that their plan uh, is, is, is sort of the one that needs to be adopted for the firm. Um, so again, a median stake of 6%, and when we track what happens to the stake over the engagement, they tend to increase, but again, the, on a, for the typical target, they will increase roughly to 10%. Okay, so these are minority blocks. And the essence of the engagement, this come back to other questions that, that were posed, um, uh, that, were, that was posed earlier, which are uh, uh, the key here is to communicate, to communicate with uh, other shareholders. Because one of the questions that was asked of me, well, what can we do as, as a corporation when we have an activist coming along? And I think the main thing is always engage with your major shareholders 
explain to them what you're doing, why you're doing that. So when an activist comes along, you're able, you're on, on a level ground in terms of communicating with these other shareholders because that's where the power of activism comes, the ability to take their stake and voice it and convince these other shareholders. Now, as I said, we track these engagements over time. So I know when, for example, Pershing Square engaged with Fortune Brands and I can see when is it that they filed the last amendment telling us that their ownership fell below 5%. So this would be one way to measure uh, how long did the engagement take and early on when uh, people would, some uh, in the media for example, would, would review activists, they would typically call them short-term arbitrageurs uh, uh, with sort of this view that these guys are there for a week, for a month, for a couple months, and then they go away. This is just not, not the case. One of the things that we do that is, uh, again, on that slide, uh, by the way, all of this information is posted on my website. So one way to do this is after the, this talk, you can go on my website and I put a, I've put a, a, a list of tables with this information uh, with a detailed description uh, of what you see in these tables. So coming back to the length of engagement, when we measure what's the typical engagement, that will roughly be a year and a half to 20 months. Some activists might take long, short, a shorter period of time because if my goal is to force the firm to be sold, maybe within six months it's clear whether that can happen or not. But there's certainly other engagement that would take two, three, or four years to, to unfold. And so uh, uh, the, there's a lot of heterogeneity, but we don't find evidence for short-termism. Uh, but much more on the order of uh, the median event taking to a year and a half to two years. Now, what are the, uh, uh, what typifies uh, uh, the kind of firm that is likely to be targeted? Uh, so what our research shows is that at least early on over the, if you look back from the mid 90s through um, uh, maybe 10 years ago, the typical firm would have been a small cap, a value firm, so these are firms with uh, low price earnings ratios, price to book, any multiple that you want, but essentially uh, small value firms uh, that um, uh, tend to have high institutional ownership. Again, as I said, the key to the success, or one key to success, is the ability to convince, to convince other shareholders of your plan. It's easier to do it when you have uh, institutional ownership that you can easily, more easily reach out to. So smaller mid-cap uh, um, value stocks, high institutional ownership, high liquidity. Again, the ability to build a stake in a short period of time is uh, uh, something that, that obviously aids or helps these activists. Um, low payout. So we see uh, firms that don't pay out that might be symptomatic of agency problems are more likely to be targeted. Um, and so uh, 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 these are roughly some of the uh, key characteristics of firms that were targeted. Of course, in the last few years, even large caps are not immune anymore from uh, targeting by activists, uh, but nevertheless, uh, smaller firms, mid-cap firms, it's easier to build that 5 to 10 percent stake uh, and engage with uh, the, uh, the target corporation. Uh, so um, let me just quickly, as I'm going through, see some of the comments that are coming along. Uh, one of the things that, for example, one of the questions that, that has just been asked is uh, hedge funds banding together, or what has been called a wolf pack. Uh, how frequent is that? So we do certainly see uh, funds, hedge funds, uh, band together. Typically, they will have to file as a group. Uh, otherwise, they run afoul of, of SEC rules. And so you may see in some, there is a fraction of funds uh, that file as a group. But at times, you may see one fund file a 13D. Then another one will come on later, uh, perhaps with a better plan uh, or just to, to, to uh, so we do see those events as well. So that can happen. 
And it raises an interesting question about the dynamics of how such wolf packs uh, um, tend to materialize. I'll come back to that in my last slide because this is uh, a topic of uh, research that I'm currently conducting. Um, so so uh, let, me, um, let me come back to some of these, the, these questions a bit later. Uh, so these are the, uh, let me, and, and return to where we're in the presentation. Um, uh, the, we've talked about the uh, type of firms that get targeted. And uh, uh, I want now, to, if you can put up slide 12 on, on, on the screen. Um, and uh, uh, this, this is sort of something, the slide that I want to focus on just a little bit to explain what we're doing here. Um, uh, the graph that you're seeing, the plot that you're seeing is called an event study. What effectively I'm doing here is tracing out what happens to the stock price from 20 days before to 20 days after the activism has been announced to the world via the filing of a 13D. So the way to think about uh, the blue line on the screen is that it tells you what is the return. Had you known that uh, a filing will be made in 20 days, what's the abnormal return to you if you're long uh, in, in the target firm shares and you've short the market? So I'm netting out any market effects and then I'm tracing out what happens to uh, return to you uh, if, you were, if you knew of the, uh, the engagement that is about to be announced. And what you can see that from 20 days before to 20 days after, prices jump by about 5, 5.5% five uh, um, on average. There's a lot of heterogeneity, but this is a very large jump. So overall, and one thing that, I'll, that we see is that the market seems to believe that activism increases shareholder value. Okay, uh, we'll see a, one of the slides that I'll get to later uh, talk, it shows that there's no evidence that this is sort of an overreaction, that prices jump and then kind of fall back down. In fact, this is a permanent upward revision in markets' beliefs about the value, uh, the share value. So uh, uh, prices jump. Uh, uh, this, this jump, if you can, if you, if, I don't know how clearly uh, the slide shows up uh, on your screen, but you can see that about more than two thirds, I don't know, maybe 70% uh, of the drift in this blue line occur prior to the event date, prior to day zero. So that means, uh, the way to think about that is uh, uh, I'm the activist, I'm accumulating my, say, 6% stake in the target corporation, and in the days before my filing, uh, the market maker or whoever is on the other side realizes that something is going on, prices start to rise. And when it's announced to the public, there's a further jump, but, but sort of perhaps an additional 1% or 2% uh, of value are added. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, that overall adds up to the 5 to 6% in uh, abnormal returns. Uh, and the way to think about this 5 or 6% is, at least in an efficient market, this is the gain to the activists. This is where they're going to make the return on their stake on uh, the engagement that they're now locked into with the target, which might take a year, two or three years to unfold. Okay, that's the return to them uh, for spending the costs uh, with these engagements. And this is actually related to one question that Matt asked a few days ago. He was asking about uh, uh, um, about the, the uh, uh, costs uh, associated with activism. And this jump that I've shown, this 5%, 6% uh, drift in the stock price, ought to compensate these activists uh, for the research that they've done uh, and for potential costs associated with engagement with management. These engagement may end up in proxy contests, in litigation, 
And those costs may range from less than a million to tens of thousands of millions. And so uh, 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 activism is costly depending on the nature of what you want to do with the target and whether the target uh, acquiesces or not. Uh, but that price jump is where the gains to the activists uh, tend mostly to reside, uh, and this is important. The thing that also to emphasize here is that since the activists have roughly 6%, at least when they initially file, 94% of the target is held by other passive investors. So 94% of the target shareholders gain just because they're passively sitting there and the activist is kind of bringing these new proposals with management. This is opposed to, for example, taking the firm private uh, 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 where shareholders might benefit less. Uh, here we're seeing how uh, um, other uh, shareholders uh, do benefit on average from such engagements. Um, one of the things that, 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 that uh, I, I, this is a subtle technical point, but I, 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 let, me, let me put it up. Uh, if you don't mind putting up the next slide on the screen. Uh, hopefully, this, uh, I, I, I want to touch upon something here, uh, which has to do with how the activists actually amass or build up their stake. Um, um, the slide that I've shown before uh, centers everything around the time that uh, the filing is met with, made with the SEC. The slide that you have now on the screen centers everything on the day in which I cross and I've amassed, I've crossed the 5% threshold. That's my day zero on this slide. And what you can see here is that uh, uh, green line, the, the dotted green line, summarizes what happens to turnover, abnormal turnover. Whereas blue line uh, still uh, traces out the abnormal return uh, to whomever knows uh, of these impending filings. But one interesting uh, uh, piece of evidence from this slide, as you can see, is that typically the activists will build up the stake and then on the day that they cross, they'll buy a somewhat large block, cross the 5%, and then you can see how the green line kind of falls back immediately towards zero. So they cross 5%, they do a bit more buying, but that's essentially it. Then they might take two days, four days, up to 10 days, and they'll file. And of course, it's interesting uh, why it takes you know, prices to drift for several days up until the filing. Is it the buying by the activists, the additional buying that prompts prices to start rising? Is it information that pass, is passed along to some other market participants who trade upon this information that leads to the price revisions? Of course, this is something that we can only speculate upon, but I thought it might be interesting to put up this other way to look at the uh, price reaction to uh, the filing. Now, uh, uh, the, let me quickly pose and, and, and answer one more question that came up uh, that, that was passed on to me. The question was uh, pointing to the fact that some observers think that activism is more prevalent near market tops. Uh, so when you go back to, to uh, the slide that I've shown on the number of events uh, uh, per year, you can clearly see that at market tops, you see many more events, many more funds coming in. And uh, uh, so, so that's clearly the case that, that market tops see more, 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 um, uh, more engagements. And, and uh, this question fits very well with the slide that, that, that I would like to, if possibly, to put up on the screen now, which is slide 14. Um, because what I'm doing here on this slide actually uh, addresses some of the, uh, um, addresses this last question. Let me first explain what you see here on the slide. For every year, I take all events that happen during that year, all filings, and I ask what's that short price price reaction that we just looked at? Obviously what I showed you before was that on average it's around 5%. 
but I can ask what's the average price reaction just in 1996 and just in 1997, just for the events in 98 and so on, all the way to 2011, which is the last year in my sample. And what you have in the bar plot are the average short run returns yearly over the sample period. And what you can see, and it's clear, I think, certainly for the latter part of the sample, is that those periods where, as the, I don't know who asked this question, I don't know if it was Justin, but those periods where you're near market tops are associated with very low average of no returns. So you can see that, uh, uh, um, for example, more recently uh, in two, 2007, 2008, uh, even 2011 already is, is, is kind of, uh, relatively speaking, quite low average of no returns. And the way to think about it is, again, competition. When you have roughly the same supply of targets and uh, you have more and more entry by, by, by activists, by more funds, the easy uh, low-hanging fruit is just not there. And so you're left with a more hostile engagement, with the more costly engagements, with the engagements that are sort of it's less clear that the va there's value being added. And so on average, at least historically, you can see that market tops are associated with uh, low average of no returns. And uh, um, I was sort of telling to some, one of my colleagues who kind of does more asset pricing uh, that Perhaps this could be used as sort of as a market timing tool in the sense that it sort of clearly is correlated as uh, the question was alluding to with sort of how the market is behaving with market tops and bottoms. And so I want to, uh, this is in short uh, um, uh, the um, uh, evidence on short run return and I want you to think of these short run returns as capturing the uh, uh, roughly capturing the gain to the activist uh, um, from, from these engagements. But remember, since their stake is roughly between 5 to 10 percent, the remaining 90 percent uh, are held by passive or other in, uh, retail or institutions who gain uh, free ride on the activities of uh, the, uh, the activist investors. Now, uh, let me quickly say something about um, uh, uh, the concern. You might be concerned that these short-run price reactions that I've shown are temporary, and perhaps the market gets excited that, that Carl Icahn, Nelson Peltz, uh, Bill Ackman have, have engaged with the target, prices jump, but within a few weeks, prices uh, tend to fall back to uh, you know, where they used to be uh, before the activism. That's easily testable because what I can do is create a trading strategy that buys all recent targets and holds them for a year, two years, three years. And if in fact this is a temporary overreaction, these trading strategies would yield negative abnormal returns. It would yield negative alphas. We don't see that. Okay, and so no matter how far out you go, you can go even five years out, there's no evidence on average that uh, prices uh, rose too high or too low. Alphas are insignificant from zero. In fact, alphas are insignificant from zero even after activists have left the target. Okay, so I may engage with the target for two years, exit, and when my, the trading strategy says buy all such firms that were targeted, what is the abnormal return? Uh, the abnormal return is insignificantly different from zero. Okay, so it seems that prices on average react appropriately uh, to uh, the arrival of the activists. And so coming back to a question that uh, um, uh, was posed by Gil Libling, you know, can, can one follow uh, these activists' investors? Well, if you try to follow them once the 13D has been announced, at least from our evidence, and again, I've put up the, 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 these regressions uh, um, uh, on my website, there's no evidence that you can make up no return, again, which is consistent with an efficient market. Prices rise on average to where they ought to go, so if you trade on publicly available information, you're not making any abnormal return. Of course, the trick is to try to guess 
where the activist is going to go, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there trying to do that. Uh, and that is something, again, you know, that, that, that uh, may be profitable if, if, if you have an insight on uh, which are the likely firms to be targeted. Uh, the nice thing about trying to outguess or see where activists will go is that the typical target, as I mentioned before, is a small to mid-cap firm that is a value stock. And we know that size and value are associated with higher average returns. And so uh, even if you have not been able to, to target um, a future, uh, to be able to purchase into uh, 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 a future target, you are essentially exposing, you're tilting your portfolio towards small value. Uh, but nevertheless, of course, activists know that they're being mimicked, and uh, that's, of course, a pretty tough thing to do. Um, I want to spend uh, now the latter part of my uh, uh, talk uh, to say something about firm performance. After all, if prices jump uh, and they don't seem to revert back down, what is the sources? Where is the the you know what is the value added that activists brings bring about? And so, several papers we've tried to address that question. Uh, and 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 so uh, one thing that we've tried to do, and and I think I can if you can look put up slide 18, uh, is you can look at profitability. Right. So you look something like uh, return on assets, and you plot the return on assets in blue from three years before to three years after the engagement, uh, uh, you can see that uh, targets, as we edge into the year of the activism, they were actually doing quite well three years beforehand. But then relative to their peers from the same industry, they tend to uh, underperform relative to these peers. And then within three years after, you can see immediately a rebound uh, within the next three years, which actually lasts even longer than that. And so this evidence of a U-shaped pattern is there, no matter, is there, uh, 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 can be captured in several ways. Uh, um, uh, and, and one of the things that we've, we've, uh, uh, we've done in, our, in, in previous work and even concurrent work is try to think about all possible ways to measure sort of this, this upswing in performance. Because one of the things you'd be worried about is that perhaps target firms may disappear from the sample, uh, perhaps because they're harmed by the activist. And so uh, we don't get to observe in these three years after engagement all the targets. The ones that tend to disappear are the ones that, 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 that tend to underperform the most. And so, in several papers, we've tried to address that. Uh, and in fact, what is interesting is that targets of hedge fund activism that disappear uh, over the first few years after the engagement, if anything, do better than the ones that remain. Those are the ones that are pushed to be sold off to a better, man to a different management. Uh, and, and I'll come back to that piece of evidence because it was very important for us to kind of uh, uh, see not only what happens to firms that remain in our sample, but also the ones that tend to depart from it. But on profitability, we, we observe uh, improvement in performance. We've also seen uh, uh, increase in payout. We've seen some cut in compensation, increase in pay for performance, uh, also so, uh, within the first few years uh, post-engagement. But I want to uh, give you one more piece of, of recent evidence on uh, um, what happens to, pro to firm performance. And let me kind of, if you can pull up slide 19 quickly. This is uh, evidence from, uh, uh, based on uh, data from the US Census, where we uh, uh, are able to track what happens, not at the firm level, but what happens to plants that are owned by targeted firms in the manufacturing industries, manufacturing plants. The nice thing about the census data is that I can trace what happened to the plant, I can measure total factor productivity, and I can also measure what happens to plants that get sold, which I couldn't do before with other standard databases. And so, uh, um, if you can put up slide 21, 
Uh, there's various ways of, again, uh, 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 presenting uh, the evidence on total factor productivity. But again, for the plants that remain with the activists, total factor productivity improves in the three years post-engagement. When you trace what happens to plants that get sold, you observe that their performance increases at the hand, with the hands of the new management. Again, this is evidence that is very hard to, 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 to uh, assess or measure with standard databases, which you can do with the census. And uh, all of these results, of course, has been have been cleared uh, uh, with the Census Bureau. So again, a piece that sort of tends to corroborate what happens to profitability, and again, would therefore be consistent with the price reaction that we've observed uh, when the market first learns of the engagement. Now, uh, uh, I want to um, uh, touch upon uh, um, uh, one more uh, uh, study that we've done early on, which is rather than look at the performance of the uh, um, uh, target firms, if we think that hedge fund activism uh, is a viable strategy, strategy that perhaps you may want to, uh, uh, you, uh, you might think that, uh, you might ask whether it will uh, continue in the future, you want to ask, well, how profitable are these hedge funds? Of course, looking at the fund performance is, is challenging because not all funds report to, to some of the hedge fund databases. There's some selection issues with which funds get reported. Do all funds uh, report their fund returns? Nevertheless, for those that we could collect data on, we wrote a, a short piece in the, um, a few years back and we again measured their performance. again standard uh, uh, asset pricing models to look, see how do these hedge fund activist funds fare uh, relative to other equity funds, for example. And uh, uh, what we've seen is that the fund performance, at least then, was, was very strong. It was the, the alphas for these funds were actually even higher than other uh, uh, equity funds not uh, focused necessarily on activism. This is, again, data that uh, uh, um, um, uh, again, that paper is also available on my website. But at least early on, these funds were quite profitable. Of course, how much of the profitability is driven from the return on the, uh, that we've seen the 5% jump in the stock price, how much of that is driven, for example, by other derivatives that they may own? This comes back to, to um, uh, use of other derivatives is harder to get it. So one of the questions here talks about the use of options. Um, this, some activists do use options. So the question here references Icon, but Pershing Square uses options, uses swaps. Uh, and so uh, it's not always uh, um, in the typical database that we have access to, it's not always uh, possible to tell uh, what are all the derivatives that have been used and what other ways activists have to uh, uh, make an, you know, increase their uh, exposure to uh, uh, the value improvement that they're going to bring about. Again, uh, in some of those 13 Ds that, I've, that, I've, that you, as I presented uh, before, you will see those, uh, uh, the activists actually tell you what, what their position is in derivatives. So Pershing Square typically is very clear about uh, the, the, the options that they've traded and the swaps, that the positions that they have. Uh, so is Carl Icahn uh, and some of the other funds. But it's again, there's no comprehensive database that, that allows us to clearly uh, um, tell uh, how frequent is the use and how large is the use. Um, I want to uh, then now summarize towards the end of this presentation to, to uh, kind of summarize a little bit of kind of about, about what we've learned so far about that five or six percent jump in, in value creation. As I said, I don't think, at least the evidence doesn't point to these value added being a fleeting uh, instance in the sense that we don't see prices jump and then uh, come back down. It seems to be a permanent revaluation. And uh, 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 
in some of our work, we have also focused on the fact that, uh, the and this is a real concern, that yes, this is not an evidence of overreaction, but perhaps the price jump, although it's there, may not reflect uh, the value, the anticipated value added, but it could be just the market realizing that the uh, the firm is just mispriced. It's undervalued. And so if Carl Icahn purchases a stake, perhaps the firm is undervalued, prices jump, but not because of any value uh, that is, will be added in the future. Uh, we've touched upon that. There's various tests you can do, and, and I don't think that that's a viable uh, 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 explanation. Surely these activists are very shrewd and smart, and some of the jump may reflect uh, stock picking ability but I don't think in any way uh, that that uh, explains the, the, the uh, price jumps that we've seen. Where is the value coming from? As I said, uh, uh, we've seen improvements in ROA, improvements in TFP. Um, there's some evidence suggesting that some of the value may be coming from bondholders, to the extent that the firm is selling some assets sending, uh, that may harm, uh, uh, may, may affect the value of the firm bond, uh, firm fixed income that they've issued. Perhaps some of the value is driven by a reshuffling of wealth between bondholders and equity holders. Again, our research, we've seen these price shams occur even in cases where the firm had virtually no leverage. So. Uh, tra wealth transfer from bondholders is a possible avenue, but I don't think it's uh, um, a major one. I think management uh, compensation may cut, be cut, so some of the wealth may be uh, uh, driven by wealth transfer from, from, from um, management, and perhaps from employees. And so uh, uh, we see uh, in our recent work that um, employee productivity goes up, but we don't see their wages going up. Whether productivity goes up because it was inefficient before or not, that's part of our current research. But again, some of that wealth transfer might be uh, driven by uh, uh, what happens to employees. So it's a combination of all of these factors that uh, uh, Wealth transfer from some of the claim holders, improvement in uh, the ability to run the business, improvement in the sense that you're reallocating non-core cap capital that is not managed well to other management that will do a better job. All of these are priced by the market to generate these price changes that uh, we've seen before. And I want to conclude. Uh, uh, I don't know how much time that we have, but uh, uh, um, let me uh, put up one last slide, uh, which is slide 27. And slide 27 gives you just a range of questions that, that um, uh, several uh, academic uh, uh, teams are working on uh, uh, that I just want to point out uh, uh, of so this, 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 because this, this Hedge fund activism sort of is a new phenomena. Much of the research is still ongoing. So we have work, for example, that looks at the impact not only on the target, but what happens to other firms in the same industry? What happens to rivals when, when a firm is targeted? And uh, one of the things that we see is that, uh, and there are several uh, papers, uh, at least two papers that I'm aware of that, that, that look at that question, uh, these papers in particular ask, what is it that the threat of activism does to firms in a given industry? And this relates to one of the questions that were posed to me um, earlier on uh, by Matt in terms of how firms should engage with, 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 with activists. And over the last few years, we've seen uh, uh, firms in, uh, uh, taking proactive actions because they sense the, the, the potential arrival of activists. And by taking these proactive actions, they're able to improve their performance and therefore uh, uh, reduce the probability that uh, they'll be uh, targeted by these veteran activists. So there's some work that looks at not the engagement itself, but the threat of engagement and how that uh, uh, tends to improve the performance of all of these firms and obviously shared by all shareholders. 
Other work uh, looks at corporate innovation. So one of our uh, uh, recent work, we ask, well, what happens to these firms in the long run? I mean, if you're concerned that their, their, their ability to compete, target firms' ability to compete might be harmed in the long run, we ask what happens to uh, innovation. And uh, so we look at patents, we look at citations, we look at what happens to innovators. Uh, and, and again, our, this is sort of very, very early p uh, evidence, uh, is that we don't see that these firms, although they become leaner, that they're becoming weaker. If anything, innovators that remain with their uh, you know, mother firm tend to be more productive. And those that leave are actually more productive uh, in the next in, uh, with their next employer. We don't see any evidence that, that the patents that the firm uh, uh, generates after the arrival of the activists are less impactful or less efficient uh, uh, than matched firms. So this is again an ongoing research, uh, which maybe next year I'll get to, to, to uh, describe. So innovation is one interesting uh, aspect, but corporate culture is another uh, interesting question. And we, at Fuqua, uh, just hired uh, this last year um, uh, uh, an assistant professor uh, who, whose thesis is looking at corporate culture. And she is looking at uh, the impact that various institutional engagements, uh, including activism, have on corporate culture. Uh, uh, we have obviously, as the question uh, was asking me before, trying to focus on derivatives. Of course, that's challenging because there's no good data uh, to, base, uh, to base an academic study that will be comprehensive and, uh, and sort of bias-free. Uh, we're trying to do something along those lines because as the question uh, I, uh, was posed earlier, I totally agree that knowing more about uh, the activists' other holdings in the target is very important uh, to understand their incentives and the profitability. Um, and again, as you can see, uh, as I pointed here, we have ongoing work on Wolfpack, which we already addressed in uh, one of the earlier questions. Questions that have to do with liquidity. How does liquidity affect uh, the uh, willingness of activists to come along? And I've already said that more liquid targets uh, uh, facilitate activism. And some of the research that we've seen uh, over the last uh, year or two look at how activists build their blocks in the few quarters leading up to the filing of the Schedule 13D. I will conclude by maybe uh, a few sentences on causality, which is the last bullet point on, your, on, on, on the slide. I didn't emphasize causality, but I think it's an important issue. Uh, one of the uh, um, uh, stubborn or, or the issues that afflict corporate finances in general is how to tell cause and effect, how to tell that it is the activist actions that have, that have led to the improvement in the uh, few years post-engagement. Uh, that is always uh, a challenging uh, 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 question to tell uh, the, the, you know, to tell apart this causal effect of the activists from other explanations. For example, you could argue that activists are very good at anticipating changes in the industry, changes that would have occurred anyway, and by buying into the target, they're just sort of benefiting from what would have occurred otherwise. Again, we have several tests. I don't think that this is, uh, would explain our results, although I'm sure that that accounts for some of the evidence. Uh, but again, uh, uh, this is this is sort of a uh, set of tests that would require uh, more time. And again, they're expl better explained some of the papers that um, uh, are posted online on my website. So that's that's the the, the presentation for uh, today on hedge fund activism. I want to thank you for uh, 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 attending, uh, sending the questions, and. Just to remind you that the next presentation is by Fernando Bernstein, my colleague, a professor of uh, operations management, and he will present in October. And I understand that more details on his presentation will be available in September. Thank you.